And we're back with Cassidy Hutchinson. Cassidy, what was Mark Meadows burning every day? Yeah, I, I wish I knew Nicole. Uh, there were several times I would walk into Mark's office and I would see him putting papers into the fireplace. And I would like to put on the record too, and I don't have the exact phrasing, perhaps you do, that his spokesperson came out and said that he was putting newspapers into the fireplace. Um, which is possible, maybe that was what he Can we just stop here, point, though? I don't it's, it's, every West Wing office, can you explain what a burn bag is? Yes. Like, you don't actually need to burn anything because there's a burn bag in every West Wing office. Correct. I'm sure your West Wing had burn bags. Oh, we, yes, we did have burn bags. And this also is, and thank you, this because it's, uh, I think it's important to, to talk about and you know, educate the public on. So in the White House, there are devices called burn bags where you're supposed to put any record that there's already a copy of to get properly disposed of. Um, that doesn't need to go to the presidential archives. Mm -hmm. There was an era, or there was an aura of paranoia around burn bags and the deep states. Oh, who would the, read it? Or in, in the Trump administration, where that's amazing. When the burn bag, supposedly, when the burn bags would be taken away, they the contents would be then sifted through national security staffers and sent to the press or something. That's amazing. <laughs> Whatever the deep state. That's an amazing do. piece of color. So, but, so you didn't trust the burn bag. So he was ostensibly burning. That's what it appeared to me to be. But you know, Nicole, I also I think this is also emblematic of a bigger issue at hand, and it doesn't just have to do with Mark Meadows. Although in this particular instance, it does. And I touched on it earlier, but. These are the people that worked for Donald Trump in the first term, at the end of the first term. Not everyone was bad, or not everyone had bad intentions, or intentions that weren't meant to uphold the Constitution and serve the executive branch. But we also did see this cast of characters come in. Again, I'm speaking with my hindsight now. Yeah. But we did see this cast of characters come in and use their positions to either bloat their own sense of power and egos or also just to advance their own agendas. And that's not what it means to serve the president. But, and these but, are the same people, though, that would potentially be working for in Donald a second Trump term. in the second Donald Trump term. Did you tell anyone about the burning of documents in Mark Meadows' fireplace? I mean, John Ratcliffe features prominently. He comes, you guys put on your coats and get a coffee and talk. He's the head of national intelligence. Did you tell anyone you were worried about how much paper was being burned in Meadows' fireplace? No, I, I didn't. Um, Mark Meadows was the most senior person in the executive branch, aside right. from Other than Trump. the president. Right. So any natural conversation I would have had with somebody to raise concerns. Mm -hmm would not really have been disloyal. Correct. Um, but it, and just to be honest and frank about it too, yes, it was something that turned my head and I, I knew it was wrong. I felt that he shouldn't be doing it. But we also have to understand there was a lot going on in this period. So it was almost like the, on a daily basis, what battles it becomes are we relative. going to pick and choose? Yeah. It's not that this was not important. But it may not have been the most important thing that day. I, I, there are many times I'd go into his office with a list of seven or eight things to talk to him about, and I might get one and a half accomplished before the next issue would arise. Do you know what he was doing with all the crossfire hurricane classified documents? Declassifying them. Or Did he succeed? Or attempting to declassify them. From what I understand, and this is according to public reporting now, I haven't followed this issue very closely, but I am under the impression that their the documents are still not fully declassified. The efforts to declassify the crossfire hurricane documents began before Christmas of 2020 and supposedly ended right almost right, 11.45 exactly <laughs> on Inauguration Day. So this was a long-winded effort where there were multiple people involved, some at the White House, not to later stages, some from Capitol Hill that came to, uh, that came to the White House to help with these efforts. I am under the impression that these documents still have not been declassified mm -hmm. because there are still are issues with the classification markings. But again, I I would turn to the Department of Justice or the National Archives for a, a more official and updated comment on that. All that. Do you know if the recording he did of Pelosi was the only recording Mark Meadows ever did? I don't know. Did you ever record anything? No, I did not. Did other people record stuff? Not that I was aware of. Um, 
not that I was aware of. So I'm trying it's to a weird through. scene, right? I mean, you get a, you're in the it's car. It's very possible it's, that right? other people could have right. reported things. I just it, not, I talking about, not that I was aware of or that would have sparked a concern to me. And even in that moment, you know, I people record conversations. There was the Raffensperger call was recorded and that was released to the public. The call, uh, I don't know the exact date, but there was a call with Republican, the House Republican conference after January 6th that was recorded and mm. released to the public. So it's what marked of recording that conversation is one to the much excusing it. It's not right. But to me, it felt like a breach, breach of trust. This was a point where we were trying to work very closely with Speaker Pelosi and her staff to pass a COVID spending bill. And I was working and had worked for my tenure at the White House to build a good relationship with her staff. So for me in that moment, it felt like a, a breach of trust with me and Mark's relationship, but also a breach of trust in what we were trying to do, because I wasn't sure what he wanted to do with that recording. Um, but it was more in that moment, it was more something that perked my ears up and made me hire my guard with him a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, but again, it's it's not inherently it's not inherently something that he should not have been doing. It's just something that sort of sheds light light on the overall paranoia of the administration. I mean, the burn bag story is is incredible. Um, I worked there for five years. I never knew anyone to be afraid of it. Something that that's an incredible insight. I want to ask you about the threats that you face because tragically you're not the only one. Um, a woman in Texas was arrested for threatening to kill Judge Chutkin, who has the federal election interference case. Paul Pelosi, the speaker's husband, was brutally attacked by someone who believed in conspiracy theories. And you write about your your pain and, and your admiration for the uh, men and women who protect the building you used to work at intern in the U.S. Capitol. Um, when the threats came down against you, and when you think about the possibility of a second Trump presidency, what do you think? What do you feel? What do you want people to know about how dangerous he is? Donald Trump, for the last seven years, seven plus years, has shown us exactly who he is, time and time again. I am guilty of being complicit and not understanding that his words have an impact and have a very strong impact on his base. Putting these threats to me that on my left side, because, you know, I, I came forward to the committee to be forthcoming, to be truthful, to provide what I knew. I knew what I was getting myself into by doing that. And I had made peace with that. You know, I had been on the inside. I, I knew the vitriolic rhetoric that he is capable of doing. I knew what could happen and that I would become a target. But that was something that I made peace with because this is a moment that's bigger than us. With that being said, though, with the platform that we have, it's important to communicate to people that his words matter. His words have an impact. I think of Rusty Bowers, mm -hmm. who did the right thing in his job in Arizona during the election fraud that Donald Trump was waging against him. And then Donald Trump turned his supporters against Rusty Bowers, who couldn't leave his house. That is an egregious, egregious act on a honorable public servant. Rusty Bowers isn't the only person. We saw it, the, the tweet that Donald Trump sent out this past weekend at mm -hmm. General Mark Milley. We need to believe him. We need to believe that he is who he is. We need to believe and we need to amplify that this rhetoric not only isn't normal, but it can't be welcomed in our system of government if we want democracy democracy to survive. Will you take that message to the Republican base? That I think that it's vital to take that message to the Republican base. And if you had to look at that debate stage tonight, do you have a favorite? I think about the debate several weeks ago when Brett Baer asked a very pointed question, and it was something to the effect of, if Donald Trump is tried and convicted, would you still support him if he is the party's nominee? And Every everybody's hand hands on that, on that stage were raised except for two individuals, mm -hmm. Chris Christie and Asa Hutchinson. Mm -hmm. Asa Hutchinson is not going to be on that stage tonight. 
To me, at this moment, Chris Christie is the only person who is qualified to serve the office of the presidency for the Republican nomination. Because if you are willing to support somebody that has assaulted the Constitution and who would be a convicted felon for assaulting the Constitution, that's not only an, uh, an anti-Republican principle, that's an anti-democratic principle. That is the most un-American thing that any candidate could do. That itself, to me, is an assault on our democracy. But with that said too, Nicole, Donald Trump's poll numbers today, as reported, are higher than they were several weeks ago on that first debate. I don't know if he will be the nominee next year, but I think that we all need to do everything that we can to make sure that he isn't. Because if Chris Christie is our only hope right now, that he is the only person that we can trust to uphold our Constitution, and it's him versus Donald Trump, you know, I, I would hope that it would be Chris Christie on that ticket. But right now, it doesn't look like that, that's going to be the case. Liz Cheney really walked the walk in the midterms and endorsed Democratic candidates. Would you do the same in the 2024 presidential contest? In the presidential contest? Mm -hmm. You know, right now, I'm not going to sit here and hypothesize about a scenario where Donald Trump would be the Republican nominee. I would hope that we could come back and put somebody on the ticket that is not Donald Trump and is, that is Christy. not threatening <laughs> and that is not threatening an assault on our democracy. I haven't made my mind up about who I would support if Donald Trump is the nominee, but I'm not closing any doors to supporting a Democrat or Republican or writing somebody in or an independent or writing somebody in.